Good afternoon, everybody. It's Wednesday, and that means it's time for our Go Digital Western Cape webinar. It's really good to have all of you with us, um, and uh, we'd like to extend a very warm welcome. My name is Robert Davids. I'm with the Digital Economy Unit at the Department of Economic Development and Tourism at the Western Cape Government. Um, and this webinar series is brought to you um, by the department. And um, as I said, um, I'll be your host for the, the next hour or so. So for those of you who may have joined us on previous webinars, um, it's good to see you back with us again. And, and thanks for, for, for joining us again. And then to the audience members who are joining us for the first time, um, welcome to you also. Uh, it's nice to have some new faces in the crowd. And then just um, on, a, on a short technical matter, um, for those of you who can see the screen, I think you are able to see my screen being shared. We just ask as a matter of courtesy that you turn off all video and audio feeds um, so that we have a smooth session with our presenters and that there's no unintentional interference going forward. So um, back to today's webinar. Um, of course, you know by now that the title of today's webinar is demystifying mobile payments and how to pay and get paid with your phone. And that's a topic which I think affects all of us as uh, owners or entrepreneurs um, within the SMB environment, and then also us as users. But I'll, I'll say a bit more about the actual topic um, in, in a few minutes. Before I get to the, the, the body of today's session, I just want to spend a, a little time on some um, technical matters. So firstly, just to, to reiterate and request again um, that all members of the audience who are joining our session, please turn off your video and your audio feed. Uh, if you haven't done that, please do so now. Um, that's just to um, uh, prevent any unintentional interruptions during the presentations a bit later. Then secondly, um, I would like to ask or inform you at least that this webinar is being recorded. The reason we record the webinar is that um, for you who are audience members today, in the future, you may want to come back and reference some of the material um, that have been discussed today. And then also for those members of our business community who are not able to join um, on the live webinar today, we do make a recording and we place it on our website, um, which I'll share with you a bit later in the session. So please note that the webinar is being recorded. Then um, uh, thirdly, which is important to, to know is we um, have question and answer um, during the webinar, but we please ask you not to ask them directly during the session, but we have a moderated question and answer session at the end of the presentations today. Um, if you do have any questions, we kind of request you to type them in the chat window. Um, you'll see there's a, on the toolbar, there's a little text box and the chat window will pop up on your right. So if you do have any questions which you um, would like to lodge, please just type them um, in the chat window, we'll moderate that, and depending on time, I'll do a bit of a Q&A with our presenters at the, the end of today's session. Then um, lastly, for those of you who may be quite active on social media, um, the hashtag for the session is Go Digital Western Cape. So if you'd like to share anything or, or promote with, with your friends and, and colleagues, um, please go ahead and use that hashtag. Okay. So that's it um, in terms of, of house rules. Then what I'd just like to spend a little bit more time on is also just some context to these actual um, webinars and the Go Digital Western Cape webinar series. As I said um, in the introduction, I'm from the Digital Economy Unit here at the Department of Economic Development and Tourism. And the Go Digital Western Cape campaign is part of a much broader initiative within the department um, in direct response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the work that the department is doing to support our business ecosystem in the Western Cape. So there are many facets to the campaign and it forms part of a set of several other um, initiatives and projects within the department, which is specifically geared towards supporting our businesses in the, in the province during this, this very challenging and very difficult time. The, Go Digital Western Cape webinar series itself um, are, of course, these live sessions, which we run weekly um, on Wednesdays at 12.30. Today happens to be our 13th one, which uh, in our books is, a, is a, a good luck number. 
So this is our 13th session and we have, a, have had a very great run thus far. Um, the topics in general um, are on, the, on aspects of the digitization of businesses, um, on e-commerce and everything that goes together with that. Legal aspects, cybersecurity, um, online platforms for retail, um, various others. And you can uh, check out our website where recordings of all the past 12 webinars are actually um, placed there for your convenience. So if you have interest, you can go, go back for reference purposes. But these webinars are really geared towards um, providing you, um, our business community in, in, in the province, um, particularly SMEs who are classified as non-tech, so not in the ICT sector, but non-tech SMEs, with um, information um, to create awareness and to give some practical tools and tips and um, share thoughts from from pioneers and thought leaders in the industry on the various topics about the current opportunities and future trends about digital and as i said which has become especially relevant now in the um, COVID 19 period so um, on that note i just want to say that um, it's really good to have all of you with us again and um, that it's we're really excited about um, the session with, with you today so coming on to our topic for today um, demystifying mobile payments. So some of you may wonder why we chose that, um, the word demystifying. Um, but I think very often for people uh, and businesses who haven't moved into the digital space completely, there is a bit of uncertainty about the security around the um, how to use uh, online systems. And in this case, of course, payment systems, which are especially sometimes perceived by the public um, to be risky if you don't understand how the systems work. So today we are going to try and demystify this world of, of mobile payments, specifically around um, payments um, using your phone, because of course there are um, there's a, the broader um, topic of virtual payments or contactless payments, which during the pandemic are becoming um, very uh, relevant and more important because uh, of social distancing and not touching various surfaces. But today we're going to look specifically around um, uh, mobile payments on your phone. And um, I think what's also important to know before I get to our presenters for today um, is that we're going to look at it within the context of the formal economy, but also within the context of the informal economy. Um, and as I said before, we can, this affects us both as users, but also as um, members of the public um, in terms of how these systems can help us to, in, in practical ways and in safe ways, to continue doing business and um, to move into the world of e-commerce. The, the reason why I mentioned the informal economy is that very often it is, it is um, thought that um, systems like, like these are only applicable to the formal economy, but that's not the case. It's also very um, relevant to the informal economy and the informal eco economy sometimes is also misunderstood. Um, it includes what is often referred to as the township economy, but it also um, includes many, many other thousands of, of business people who may be artisans, who may be um, self-employed, um, sole proprietors, who, who may be um, people in the industry of, of hairstyling or any other kind of service related industry. Mm -hmm. So today we're going to look at demystifying mobile payments, as the, the topic said, um, but also we're going to look at how it applies to both the informal um, and the formal economies. And on that note, um, I'd like to introduce our two presenters for today. Um, firstly, from SnapScan, we have the CEO of SnapScan, uh, Mr. Chris Zitzman. Um, and then secondly, we have Sanere Gaka from uh, Sakika Solutions. And uh, today they're going to do a bit of a tag team on uh, this, this this matter of mobile payments. So to Chris and to Sanele um, from our business community and from the department, thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for your um, your efforts and for prioritizing this session. Um, it's really great to have um, uh, professionals and leaders in this environment such as yourselves on this, this this webinar session with us. So we look forward to what we what you are going to share with us today. And we're really excited about, about the session. So um, firstly, I'm going to hand over to, to Chris from SnapScan. Many of you 
might be very familiar with Snapscan and seeing the brand around in retail stores and, and, and other places. So as I'm not the expert on this topic, I'll stop talking now. And Chris, um, if you're ready, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, that's a, a very nice um, introduction. Um, from the looks of it, I need to get a new headshot. I think Sonela is looking much more handsome than I am. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so thank you very, very much for, for highlighting that uh, to me. Um, I think before I kick off and, and I start my presentation, I just want to give a, a quick little intro around how we feel about this, this forum. I think for us, it's, it's an exciting opportunity to, um, to engage with individuals that we, we normally engage with through digital channels like our, um, our e-commerce or sorry, our, our um, online uh, merchant portal or users who engage through, um, through Snapscan as an application on their phones. Um, but, you know, we, we get a, a number of questions um, around our product, how it works, um, who are involved with our product. Uh, our payments and Snapscan in particular, um, to summarize them and just give clarity to individuals um, that uh, that want to learn more about it. So this is very uh, exciting for us. Um, trying to just quickly share my screen with everyone. Um, right. So so there's there's four broad myths um, that we've summarized, um, and I think I'm going to kind of head right into it. And, and as we go through it. Um, we're going to touch on a number of the the often uh, glossed over questions that we get about uh, uh, mobile payments in particular. So the first um, the first statement that we've got on here is uh, myth number one, which is that a quick response code or QR code, as it's um, uh, generally known in the market, mobile payments are new and have limited use. Um, now. I want to, to show you a picture of a, a very um, kind lady in China, and I think she would disagree with you. Uh, so in, in China, uh, mobile payments have been around uh, since 2011, so, so right after the, the big recession, essentially. Um, and mobile payments has really um, been the foundation upon which um, China has been able to, <clears throat> to formalize its informal market. So. Um, this individual has uh, three QR codes um, through which she can accept mobile payments from um, from her customers. Um, and I think the one that, that South Africans would be uh, most familiar with is an application called WeChat, which is the QR code that's right in the middle there. Um, and so WeChat is very much um, in China uh, a, a similar type product as um as WhatsApp that we know in, in, in our country, and that's very prevalent as a messaging platform. But in China, it also incorporates a payment piece um, like Snapscan that we're going to explore today. Um, so the concept of QR-based mobile payments and, and card payments through QR code um, structured uh, applications is definitely well, by no means a, a new concept. It's been around for 10 years. Um, and, you know, more than a billion people in China use it every day. And in the greater uh, Asia region, it's, it's also very popular. Um, to, to take us a, a, a South African view on this, Snapscan started in 2013. Um, we, we really just started with these uh, QR code stands that um, we issued to the merchants and that users can scan and pay, which we're going to demonstrate in just a second. Um, and we then quickly branched into a number of other use cases. So today in Cape Town, if you uh, uh, park in the CBD, you can pay with Snapscan. Um, so you don't have to lug around cash or you don't have to pay with a card machine uh, in that instance. You can use Snapscan to pay uh, at online stores like One Day Only, Bid or Buy, Take A Lot, etc. Um, you can go and uh, go to a restaurant and pay with Snapscan when you want to collect your bill. Uh, you can pay blood pathology labs that print Snapscan QR codes onto their statements that they post and send to, to their customers like a path care, or you can just use it uh, to quickly buy a coffee. So there's a number of different use cases, um, and we're going to talk about how um, QR codes in particular um, are very utilitarian, and as a merchant and as a business, you can uh, you can apply it um, in every application 
you, you can think of, um, which is very exciting because it's a very low cost way of, um, of facilitating payments. And it's also very adaptable to whatever use case you want to use it for. Um, right. Um, just to zoom in on Snapscam, we've got about 67,000 um, registered merchants on our platform um, and over a million South Africans have downloaded the app and are using it actively um, during, uh, during the month. Um, and so this is really to give some context around where mobile payments in South Africa is versus uh, the, the Asian markets. Um, I think we're really still... Um, at a at this 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 very like nested state where um, mobile payments is really only getting big traction in South Africa now, um, and there's a number of players that want to enter this market. Exciting for us, gives great value that uh, mobile payments is going to to really go through a growth spurt in the next um, next uh, months uh, and the coming year. Right, so the, the second myth that uh, exists uh, around mobile payments is that um, they are complicated and that they are hard. Um, and I just want to give you a very quick view of, um, of a merchant's view of mobile payments. So in order to start accepting mobile payments, you as a merchant just have to go and sign up for Snapscan um, online. So there's no uh, human intervention here. You can really just go to our website, snapscan.coza. Um, you can uh, register an account with us. We'll ask you for a few FICA documents like uh, your ID um, and proof of, of residence, um, almost like when you open a bank account. Um, you submit all of this digitally to us through our website. And then once you have verified, uh, we'll issue you with a QR code um, or issue you with as many QR codes that, that you would want. If you want 100 QR codes, um, uh, we can issue with 100 QR codes. And you can print this off right from, from our website. So there are a number of options in terms of how you can present your QR code. Uh, you can print it yourself. You can get a Snapscan QR code stand from us um, that we'll post to you with DHL. And that normally takes about um, two days to arrive at your door. So it's a very quick setup. And as soon as your account is registered, you're essentially ready to go. And there's no face-to-face -face interaction to get signed up for mobile payments through Snapscan. Um, once you're set up, we'll also register your phone number so that we can send you SMSs um, so that you have payment confirmation when your customers pay you. Um, and we also send daily settlement reports um, and we also have a, a nice little merchant portal uh, that's uh, all web-based that you can log into and uh, manage and, and uh, view all your different QR codes and your transactions and the phone numbers through which you receive notifications. Um, so it really is that easy. Um, if, you, if you have a browser, if you have a, a, a phone that has a browser on it, you can go and register to accept uh, mobile payments through Snapscan. Uh, on a consumer side, um, I think it's it's even easier. Um, for a, a consumer, um, the only thing that they have to do in order to start paying with Snapscan is download the application from their app store. So we are supported on the, the Apple app store, on Google, um, and, and on the, the, the new Huawei app store. Um, as soon as you've downloaded the, the app, which is very small, so it doesn't take a lot of data, um, you will then register for our service by entering in your, your email address, your phone number. You will then load your, your debit or your credit card into the application, which is a very quick step. So you'll basically just uh, scan your, your um, card in. We'll recognize the 16-digit the number, um, and we'll take you through a few steps to sec securely add that card. Um, that card is, is not stored by us, by the way. So um, Snapscan is a, a subsidiary of Standard Bank. Um, so we take that card details and we securely send it to, um, to, to Standard Bank. And it is secured uh, in what we call a token vault um, that we have no access to. So um, the, 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 the risk of fraud in mobile payments um, is generally perceived to be high because it's, it's digital and people don't really know where their car details go. Uh, but I can assure you that um, we take a, a lot of steps to ensure that these cards are securely stored 
um, and that fraudulent payments um, are, are mitigated. And I think mobile payments um, from a fraud perspective is, is safer than, than actual in-card payments because it's very difficult for third parties to clone your card uh, or to get access to it. Um, and so it, it's really safe. Once you've added a card, you'll be able to add a, a four-digit PIN. Um, if you have a smartphone that uh, is enabled for um, for things like um, uh, biometrics, that will also work. Um, and then you're ready. You can scan to pay. So here we've got a, a, a QR code which is linked to a, a an account that uh, is a test account on our side. Um, and you could, with SnapScan, scan this QR code and, and make a demo payment, so we won't uh, charge your card, um, and you can go and, and see for yourself. So uh, it's really that easy. Um, right, I want to get to the, the, the third myth. Um, um, and I think today, especially, uh, you know, as the old Mythbusters um, show used to say, this myth is totally busted. Um, I think today, the the ability to accept payments and get paid digitally through um, either a no touch or through a, um, a, a method where you can send QR codes and you can do remote payments so they're not face to face, that is king. So convenience um, and payment acceptance is king in this environment. And, I, and I, we've been taking a number of pictures and my friends send them to me. Um, and I think this is really attestation of, of the statement that I've just made. So you're seeing in, in Cape Town, for instance, a number of restaurants saying, well, sorry, we no longer handle cash. You can pay with cards or with SnapScan only, which is the picture on the left, which is Jason's Bakery uh, in Greenpoint. Um, and then if you go to the Oranjezef City Farm uh, here, uh, just next to the waterfront in Cape Town, You'll also see that they've got signs that say, sorry, snap scam or credit or, or debit cards only. We no longer handle cash. So uh, I, I don't think cash is, is king in, uh, in this environment anymore. Merchants are really streaming to um, get the ability to, to accept payments on a, um, a cost efficient manner. And that's what QR codes do. Um, so contactless payments, in our opinion, are really safer, they're quicker, and they're cheaper in the long run. Um, so you don't have to handle cash, you don't have to bank it. Um, we settle all the transactions that are processed against a merchant's account uh, right into their bank account. Um, and those settlements occur on a daily basis. So merchants get uh, quick access to all the money that we've processed for them. We do so securely for merchant and for consumer. And we do so cheaply because there is no expensive setup cost for um, devices. So you're essentially printing a, a, a card machine in that sense by printing a QR code versus purchasing a expensive uh, card machine or card reader. Um, so this is really the, the theme that we're touching on. Um, when you're trying to get paid, convenience is king. Um, and I just want to show you guys a, a quick number of, of use cases that are really cool um, and that and how we see our merchants using QR codes in ways that we we had never anticipated. So uh, a number of guys that do deliveries like Butler's Pizza and Oishi, um, they've got lanyards um, with little QR codes on them and when their delivery people arrive at consumers doors, those consumers can scan the QR code and make the payments uh, uh, to, to complete the, the payment on a COD basis. Um, we're seeing a big jump in online payments and e-commerce, so merchants introducing this QR code into their websites um, so that individuals can pay uh, without having to enter their card details into every transaction. Um, a number of merchants, as I previously had stated, print these QR codes onto their bills, their invoices, and their statements. Because what you're doing is you're really just printing a card machine and sending it into the ether and it costs you absolutely nothing. Uh, so it's really a very good scalable solution. Uh, and the other things that we're seeing is that guys are sending out QR codes and links uh, to payment links or click to pay links, uh, what we call them, uh, through WhatsApp. Uh, and that, that's really, uh, really cool. So if you click, click that link uh, that a merchant has sent you, it'll open up SnapScan and you're, you'll be able to complete the payment for that merchant. Here's a few, uh, a few practical um, pictures so that you guys know I'm not lying. So on the left-hand side, 
Um, this is Seattle coffee um, that you could order a coffee in advance with uh, when COVID had just hit. Um, you could do so by phoning them or sending them a WhatsApp and a kind guy would hand over your coffee outside of the shop and you would just quickly scan the SnapScan QR code to, to complete the payment. Klein Skis um, is another cool cafe in Seapoint um, and they did exactly the same. So you could uh, order in advance and uh, scan to pay uh, with SnapScan uh, when you got to, to their shop or they delivered and they would send the SnapScan QR code along for delivery. On the right hand side is a friend of ours who's been um, really uh, an avid SnapScan merchant since day one. Um, uh, he's uh, Johnny Barber Joel, so he does a, a company called Scoot and Cut where he drives around in his Vespa to go and do haircuts for individuals and he just takes his QR code along and gets paid conveniently. Um, these are a number of cool other instances on Instagram, uh, posting it through WhatsApp, um, and just increasing the number of channels that they can accept payments through, uh, uh, yeah, in, into a number of social channels and, and uh, um, uh, chat channels. Cool. I want to get to the last one. I think I'm taking up too, too much of our time today. Um, the last myth here is that card payment acceptance has high barriers to entry. And that, that statement used to be true, but I think uh, we've also busted that myth. Um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that mobile payments are card payments. We've just digitized the process and we've taken a, a consumer's phone and we've made that the channel through which we facilitate a digital transaction rather than an analog transaction where you would have to take out your card and dip it or uh, swipe it uh, through, a, through a card machine. So by, by doing this and by creating all these these users that actively use SnapScan as a mobile payments um, solution, um, we've been able to stay away from having to issue hardware to, to merchants. Um, and, and that's oftentimes the sticking point for a merchant. You know, they don't want to pay rental fees of more than 200 Rand or 300 Rand a month uh, to banks uh, to, to get a card machine. Uh, and they also don't want to spend the, the money to buy these card machines up front. And so that's what SnapScan is. You can print as many QR codes as you want, um, and it's, it's essentially all for free. Um, you can um, use SnapScan as a, as a mobile payment service. There's no monthly fees, and you really just pay um, a, a per transaction fee as you go. So no fixed fees, um, and you really just um, uh, pay as you go. And, and our motto has always to, been to grow with businesses. So we don't want to, to uh, make a lot of revenue from merchants that don't have massive turnover because they have to grow. So um, that's where our, our approach of taking a per transaction uh, fee comes in. Right. Um, how do you get signed up? Um, as we said, you just go onto our website. This picture shows what that landing page looks like. Uh, if you're a sole proprietor, um, all you have to do is to add your uh, banking details, which will ask uh, through a number of prompts as you sign up. Um, you'll have to upload a copy of your ID, a copy of your proof of address, um, and then you'll be essentially set up to, to start accepting payments through SnapScan. Um, and as we say, you're, you only pay when you use it, um, and there are no other uh, costs involved there. Um, before I before I stop, um, the the last picture here is really um, the the life cycle of our SnapScan merchant, um, and and this is really a summary of a lot of the experiences and uh, testimonials from some of our merchants and customers. Um, that oftentimes report back to us on how their business or businesses are doing. So, um, and this really talks to, to Rob's um, theme around uh, formal and informal um, uh, economies. So we oftentimes get a number of merchants that really start operating as informal merchants that used to only accept cash. They sign up for SnapScan um, and start accepting mobile payments. Uh, which means that individuals um, that are affluent and that have uh, smartphones can also pay them um, because these individuals no longer run around with, with wads of cash. 
Um, and as a result, they now start receiving um, uh, payments into their bank account on a, a daily basis, which then gives them a transaction record of how their business is doing. And that bank statement is something that they can take to a bank or to a third party to get funding in order to grow their businesses. So um, they then go and, and you know, become a little bit more formal and take a, a step in becoming um, a participant of a more formal in economy um, and, and kind of scale. Um, and as a result of that, uh, they can then really join this, this formal economy at a later stage uh, where they have an actual site uh, that they, they pay a lease for where you need to generate the bank statement and show a landlord how much, uh, how much turnover your business is generating and what your profits are. Thanks. I think that's, that's it for my presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Um, well, I think that I've, I've got a feeling that there's uh, much more we can talk about, but as I said today, we're just having some uh, bite-sized uh, chunks in terms of what we are able to share with, with our audience. But thank you very much. Just a, a few comments from from my side before we hand over to, to Sanele. Um, I think what was really uh, interesting was um, the fact that um, you mentioned the, the cash is king myth um, because the I think that's that's quite important and perhaps we in our current circumstances with COVID-19 and everything else going on perhaps we should start a tagline um, around convenience and safety is king because I think that's really going to be where the, the world is moving I think we've moved there already and I think what what you also touched on is really what, what lies behind what you're saying is in terms of whether it is from a merchant perspective or a user perspective, that there's quite a degree of behavioral change and a different culture of doing transactions that um, is still only settling in into our society and into our economies. And I think that's going to be something that um, we'll, be, we'll be seeing a lot of movement on in the next couple of months, um, definitely, and, and into the future. Then moving on to our, our next session, as I said, we'll do some Q&A after Sanele is part of the presentation. But moving on to our, our, our next session, I think um, the area of the informal economy, um, it's sometimes referred to as the informal sector, but for today's session, we'll refer to the informal economy. I think that is it's a very, very important part of this discussion, especially um, looking at, at business in general in the province, um, SMEs. I mean, we heard Chris speak about the about sole proprietors. Uh, we saw um, how this can be applied in both informal and, and formal economies. And what we're going to discuss now and, and what Sanele is actually going to present now is really to look at what is this, this economy, this informality, what does it actually mean? Um, and also what are the, the opportunities and what can mobile payment solutions mean for businesses and entrepreneurs in the informal economy? I think there's, there's uh, sometimes not enough awareness created, uh, not enough understanding about the opportunities. So I think that's a, a very important and a very critical field for us to explore as a department and also as a business ecosystem um, in terms of both market and in terms of, of supply chain. Um, but one last thing just before I, I hand over to Sonelli is also that from our understanding, um, the uptake and usage of mobile devices, uh, especially phones in this case, is much higher than any other kind of devices across the society, especially in the informal economy. So I think there's huge uh, untapped opportunities um, that we can look um, into as a business community and, and as, as, as government um, within the sector. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to Sonele. Um, he's a thought leader and has a lot of experience in terms of the context, but also where the challenges and blockages and the opportunities are. So, so Sonele, I'm going to hand over to you if you can take us through into the next part of the presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Very kind words indeed. Um, and very nice intro. Um, I must say, Chris, my headshot might be better than yours, but I certainly like your presentation, uh, your, your slides and your presentation style. I, I like it a lot. <laughs> so, uh, you, so you'll work on uh, a headshot and I'll work on my presentation and on, on my slides. That's a deal. <laughs> cool. So, um, so, um, uh, what I'm going to take you through is really um, around this informal economy 
And um, if I land anything today, I think uh, I'll get straight into it. But if I land anything today, as, like, as Chris has said, is that um, if you look at uh, this uprise in mobile payments over the next few months, over the next few years, and um, that uh, informal in, and, and that cash is king, I, I think what I'm trying to say here, here today is that whilst um, these mobile payments may be on the rise, you certainly cannot um, use a blanket approach in what works in the, in the formal market and bring it right into the informal market because there's certain nuances that we need to look at. And really what we've done at Sikika is, is managed to think very clearly about the market that we're trying to work with and put together a solution that will, that will ensure that the merchant, the consumer, and all the components that exist in that ecosystem in the informal market uh, um, are well catered for. And companies, and, and if you don't mind, Chris, I'll use Snapscan and not mention all the others because I'm on a platform with you, but companies like a Snapscan, when they, when they transition from the formal market into the informal market, just to be very clear on the things that they need to, to, need to look at and consider before they land their product in the informal market because the consumer is not the same and nor is the merchant. So I'll get straight into it. So, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go very quickly, but um, what, I'll, what I'll basically take you through is the Sikika Solutions offering. Um, I'll take you to the informal market development framework that I think everyone should consider and know about and be very clear on. I'll take you through technology and mobile platforms and, and, and payments and why, and why they, 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 they should be looking at the informal economy. I'll take you through uh, an enabling tool that has been put together by the Department of Small Business Development uh, in a SPASA scheme and, and exactly talk about how when you walk into this market, you need to understand all the moving parts so, so that you give solutions that best suit them. Um, and then I'll take you through a very quickly a, a case study where Sikika Solutions put together a responsible trade facilitation which, which empowered liquor outlets to be able to do what they needed to do when it came to alcohol abuse. And again, designing a solution that works for this market. And then ultimately, I'll take you through how mobile platforms can be utilized and build an inclusive economy. So very quickly, the one takeout here is really just um, um, Sapika Solutions has four core offerings. And really, um, if you look at uh, Lean Six Sigma, and really our clients that we've had there are companies like On The Dot Vector Solutions. And really, they, it's about making sure that performance is very clear, it's very visible, and you understand how to be efficient as an, as an organization. Again, we build solutions that are tailored, that are unique and bespoke to that specific, to that specific organization and ultimately um, environment. Very good project, management, pro project managers. We don't see ourselves as consultants, but rather problem solvers and really just very good project managers because we, we see ourselves as going into an organization understanding the issues that you're grappling with and really put together a, a solution that we execute ourselves, not to say, you know, from an arm length, from, from an arm's length perspective, go, go, deal with the, go deal with the problem. We deal with the problem with you. And then obviously a lot, a lot of training and, and Chris, I'll talk about how, Chris spoke about how easily it is for merchants and consumers to adapt SnapScan and just roll. But in the informal economy, you know, and Chris spoke about how they don't use, they've stayed away from devices in the, in, in, with Snapscan. So people like in the informal economy, you know, you need to keep training these guys because um, as, as easy as, as, as Snapscan seems, but on the back of it, there's commissions, there's this, there's this, there's this and that. And your merchant needs to understand that what they're paying versus bank fees versus this versus this. And actually there's a net, there's a, there's, there's, there's a net um, gain that, they, that they're making. But we, but we train our customers to understand this. And this is really what um, Sakika Solution has done, is understand and deal with the real issues and be able to build solutions that we give to these customers that they can then um, see some sort of um, um, forward momentum in their, in their organizations. As you can see there, um, we, we, we built um, a, a field force optimization for away.org and they funded by the liquor industry. And again, the case study I'll take you through is really about how Red.org managed to take a solution and take it into the informal market and be able to, um, to, to um, see some results there. So the slide that I'm, I'm gonna sort of uh, stick to a little bit is just this framework. And whenever you're looking into going to this township economy, 
is understanding what needs to happen in that economy. And basically, it's a, it's inspired by a guy called uh, De Soto, who I've enjoyed his work in this. If you've got some, some time, have a read with this book. What, what he talks about is really how, in order for our informal economy to make it, it's really they need to look at owning the, their properties that they, that, that they live in, because we know that these guys are operating businesses from where they live. And um, what needs to happen here, which is non-negotiable, is really how the regulatory framework needs to change. Now, when the regulatory framework changes and, and allows for these businesses to start having some sort of property rights transferred onto them, what that does, it, it instigates the financial sector and private sector to go and invest in those businesses. So, for example, SnapScan um, used, used the example that they stay away from devices, they stay away from, from capital um, investment that, they, that, that, that might hinder them. You can imagine, and that's in the formal market, you can imagine dropping a device in the middle of the road in Google to, you know, so, and these companies stay away because of the risk, risk involved. So if you look at what, what needs to happen and the framework around townships is really the, 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 regulatory, the regulatory framework needs to change, which then kicks into giving people property rights and they are able to secure tenure in their businesses. Because it's very different conversation saying to a guy, you know, I'll be out there. I'll bring solutions to you, I'll bring mobile payments to you, but you know you might not be here next week because this property is not yours, or it's not in your name, or so or it's not even registered as a business. So do you see how these challenges can 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 really prevent investment into this uh, the, this economy? Um, and then ultimately what I spoke about earlier is this township business support. We need once we've landed these initiatives into this market, we need to then bring it back and support them and, and ensure that these guys are able to move forward and have some sort of mom, some sort of momentum to be able to scale up their businesses because currently their businesses are very they they have a ceiling and it's basically driven by this uh, regulatory framework that keeps them out and this is a conundrum that everyone's sort of dealing with um, and when I say everyone I'm talking about the the government I'm talking about wholesalers I'm talking about manufacturers consumers. Um, and the financial sector itself. But if you look at the informal economy, at the core and at the center is the retail space. So SnapScan is 100% right. The retail space, this retail space in the informal economy accounts for a quarter of our, of our population. Um, and in this, in this space, uh, uh, Chris, I'm sorry, cash is still king. Uh, majority of the, of the transactions here are all cash. Um, and what is and, and that's driven predominantly by what you see here at 90% of South, South Africans use prepaid airtime. Um, of the 15.6 million households that are out there, 1.1 are on prepaid meters. So the money is short, right? So people then only consume for immediate consumption. They, they consume in bits and pieces. So there's 5 rand airtime, it's 10 rand airtime, you know, it's 20 rand electricity. And, and, and that's why cash will always be, well, not always, I mean, um, cash will eventually fizzle out. But that's why cash is quite important because these guys deal in small transactions but volumes of them. So it's a, it's a 20 rand transaction, 15 rand transaction, 10 rand transaction, but, but a plethora of it. Now, what's important here is uh, mobile platforms, as you know, these consumers, 45% of them are using smartphones. Um, um, Chris spoke about it earlier. I think there's more SIM cards than there are people in South Africa. Data consumption is driven by social media sites. So you can see that platforms and mobile platforms can play a massive role in this environment. And the opportunity, like I said, beckons, you know, I mean, and Chris said it, you know, the, 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 I, I can tell you right now, without even having spoken to Chris, SnapScan is looking at how they get into the informal market. And a lot of these, 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 these multinationals, uh, these manufacturers are moving physical goods into informal sector and they're doing it through the wholesaler. But one way or the other, multinationals, manufacturers, big business is trying to get into the township because they understand how big this market is. And in a study, the study that we did in Kandicha in town too, we had a 5% growth in 2018 to 2019 in number of businesses. So these businesses aren't slowing down. You know, and, and these businesses that I'm talking about is not just a HGB or it's a spada shop. It's actually like Rob said earlier, it's a barber, it's a salon, it's a chisanyama, it's a, it's a butchery. It's a, it's a hardware um, um, business. So, Chris, 
the opportunity is endless for these other. I mean, these businesses are all operating, and the consumers are slowly starting to understand that you know they can do mobile payments. And again, while cash is king in this market, cash does present risk, does present robbery from these businesses, does does present robbery from uh, consumers. So while cash is king, I can agree with Chris that it will ultimately fizzle out. So when I talk about mobile payments and this opportunity that that beckons in the informal market, it's really here where you see um, um, it, 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 is, it is so clearly highlighted. The other thing that we noticed when we did in Kalicha, those businesses that we went to, only 2% of them were banked. So that means uh, there's an opportunity there for the financial sector as well, because these guys are not going to bank accounts. And again, mobile platforms, technology can play a role in ensuring that people are banked. And I'll talk about it a little bit later. The opportunity for, 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 for technology, mobile platforms to just play, play a role in this environment. And, and the one thing I must stress also is that when you go into this environment, um, these platforms and um, organizations like your SnapScan, if they would just diversify and look at solving other issues that are faced by the merchant and the consumer um, and, and um, in enabling them to use their product, then, then we, 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 we sort of on our way to sort of a really, really being inclusive and making sure that that, that township economy is well catered for. So I've, I've just laid out that opportunity that they can write. And I mean, I, I didn't want to mention the other companies that are, that are in there that are in the mobile, um, um, that are mobile payment spaces and uh, giving devices into these um, outlets. But everyone is in there. And don't get me wrong, I like it. it it's, it's really good. They, they're there first. They're taking risks. You know, they, they're putting devices in there and they're funding that. So they're taking, they're taking a lot of risk because I know that with a lot of risk comes a lot of reward. But I want to draw a parallel uh, in, in while we put together these solutions to go work in this township. If you don't understand it clearly, you're going to find some challenges. And what's, what may seem very simple in the formal market, you can't touch, just take it into the informal market. So what government has done here, they see this opportunity, they see that um, this township economy is, is bubbling under. So then they put a, 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 a scheme, a scholarship scheme to assist them to get these benefits that are capital injection, it's a 3,500 rand once of capital, capital injection to help these guys to be able to buy stock, plus 3,500 rand reward and credit facility so that they, they can go to a macro or wholesaler and go get credit and it's all backed by government and they can be able to turn their stock. They get discounted products. So government has brokered a deal with these massive wholesalers to get discounted products so that they can, they can be competitive. Great. Design, fantastic. And then they ask for all these requirements that I've listed above there. They, they ask for a set for South African ID, they ask for a permit, they ask for um, you to be registered on the CIPC and to have a formal bank account. Now that increases the level of formality which talks to, my, to that framework I spoke about earlier. Now what that does is that government is able to get a foothold or understanding of what's happening in that unseen economy because it is unseen. It's unseen, it's, it's disconnected, call it Call it, call it what you want, but people don't know what's happening there. Great idea by government here to start understanding what's going on there. And then what they also do is give business support. On paper, fantastic uh, solution. I like it, right? And if you look here on the on the left, if you're a spider shop, you just go to a, to a net bank with your ID and your permit um, or a boxer. Um, three days later, you get an SMS. You, you, you sort of do the application at, at the bank or at boxer. Three days later, you get your SMS, and guess what? Three days later, you go pick up your card, and, and Bob's your uncle, off you go, and you can purchase at these um, wholesalers. Simple, right? Very simple, and it, and it should work. Now, design is great, but what you find in the actual implementation, okay? On the left here is, a, is an email I sent to a manager at Boxer, right? I went in, tried to understand, listen, I'm a, I'm a retailer, I've come in, I'd like to apply for my, uh, for, my, uh, see, uh, for, my, uh, for my funding, right? I had no idea what I was talking about. Now, now, what I'm trying to show you, I'm not trying to show that uh, the guys at Boxer don't, don't have an idea what they're doing. What I'm trying to show you is that here, here you have a retailer who has now left their business, okay? Taken two taxis to possibly get to a, to a, to a facility 
and apply for this funding, this capital injection, this revolving credit, and they get there and you know, the, 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 there's no understanding of what, of, 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 of what they're looking for. Now, what I'm trying to stress here is that a day out of trade for these guys, we cannot afford. Just like in the formal market, I can imagine a day out of trade, you know, to go do banking is not um, 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 optimal. It is even worse in this amount because you're spending money to be able to, to do that. And all I'm trying to show you here really is that technology can actually be part of streamlining this. There's no reason why these people couldn't have, technology couldn't have played a role here. And whether it's those devices that are sitting in these stores, because these devices are sitting in these stores, they got functionality to take pictures, they can take this ID document, they can take all the required documentation, and you can actually apply for this thing remotely. You don't need to leave your 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 shop to go do this application. These mobile platforms are able to to give you and facilitate an application remotely because all the documentation there, all the FICA requirements are there. Why can't we do that for the informal market? And on the right, I'm showing you an email that I had with the business banker at NetBank. Look at that. Um, the customer spent three and a half hours in a queue and they were told that the person that uh, is dealing with this is not, at, is not at work. And I mean, again, going back and forth, but ultimately, again, these solutions are fantastic on paper, but they haven't been designed to deal with the, with the challenges that these people face. And that's what I'm challenging um, guys like Chris and uh, all these mobile platforms to think about. When they're going in, into, the, into this market, you can solve the commercial, you can have both the commercial agenda, but also the, the societal agenda and resolve some societal issues. Now, what Sikika then did, and I mean, I'm going to skim to this, but you can um, go on our website and check what we did here. But when you, what we did for away.org, when this alcohol abuse issue was coming up, and uh, the alcohol industry really didn't know how to deal with, uh, with, with, the, um, with, the, with this issue. So we went in and, 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 and understood the tavern environment. Then what's most importantly, we then um, put in and developed and conceptualized a program and a tool that can assist the merchant in this instance and the consumer to be able to behave better in order to run a better business, but also for the consumer to make sure that they're in a safe environment. Now, we were able to track performance, right? And uh, and, and uh, you can uh, and, and, and look at our website and see how well we did there. But what I wanted to show you that we built a unique solution to deal with the, with the issue on the base of technology. Now, what we did here is we built a questionnaire and as you can see, the questionnaire had the applicable liquor act. Now, if you know anything about liquor acts, you'll know that provincially there's a different liquor act for each province. So we looked at the legislation in that province and were able to amend it and make sure that it's explained in very simple terms to the outlet owner. So Chris, your snap scans of the world, um, um, I mean, this is a liquor act. This is a like regulatory framework. It's, it's tough. It's, 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 I mean, you, you need to be an advocate to be able to read this thing. But what Sikika Solutions did was, was be able to break it down and put it in a simple format that is able to be understood by the merchant. So then the merchant knows that if I behave in this, and, and you can see there that we point to that relevant legislation that if you behave in a certain way, you are being compliant, and if you behave in a certain way, you are making more revenue, and if you, if you, if you behave, behave in a certain way, you are protecting your customers. And we waited the scoring. So it's really developing solutions through tech through technology, through um, 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 some sort of a media platform, to be able to engage that market in a way that they understand and they can respond to what you brought to them. Um, again, again, we just uh, this is just to show that we embrace technology. Nothing was done. We never took second chances. We, we, we never left anything to chance. Everything was embracing technology, and really, it is a wave of technology. And I really think, um, like Chris said, these platforms are coming up but they really should be looking at divide, designing um, um, solutions that will work for them and ultimately the merchant. And um, my last slide is really, if you look at the right here, it's that framework that I spoke about earlier is really about technology and declutter, reduce red tape and design programs and, and policy that, make, that are made for this market. 
And most importantly, the data that you'll get from there is able to provide key insights that formulate business, big business decisions that we are able to help the sector well, um, 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 work quite well. And that's it, Rob. Awesome. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sanele. I think, as with Chris, I, I have a feeling that um, both of you could still speak about these, these topics for uh, another hour or two. But as I said, unfortunately, we have a very short time um, in which to present this. So, so thank you very much um, for, for that. I think, I mean, there are so many points to take away from, from your presentation. But one really important one, I think, is that it goes, payments in the informal economy goes so much further than just the commercial transaction itself. There's, you mentioned the regulatory environment, you mentioned um, issues of trust in systems that people are unfamiliar with, you, you, you mentioned um, risk around cash, and yes, you're right, cash will still be around for a long time, um, but at the same time, it's a huge risk due to safety issues in, in, in informal sectors, which don't have necessarily always the kind of inbred design security of a formal sector in a, in a, in a strip mall or in a shop, etc. So I think you really touched on that and there are many other issues that go um, are in combination with just the commercial transaction that uh, businesses have to look at if you want to do business in the informal economy, if you don't want to access it as a market or as part of your supply chain. So, so thank you very much for that. Um, as I said, there's, there's many other takeaway points, but unfortunately we, we don't have that much time. So what, what I'd like to do um, is we're going into a, a last few minutes just before we, we round off the session um, uh, just on some questions that came up and then I have one or two questions which I'll pose to Sanela and Chris as uh, part of your closing comments. So um, I'll just share my screen here again. So, so firstly Chris, um, I think there was a question and I, and I assume and obviously either of you could answer but I think this was probably aimed at you Chris. Um, there was a question about uh, from our audience about um, when there's a mobile transaction happening um, in store um, or out of store, how does the merchant know when the payment has actually come through for that product or service that that is is, is purchased? So um, perhaps any any um, feedback on that, Chris, and then I'll come back to you soon today. Yeah, I, I, before I give the answer to that, I'm I'm quite enthused by by all of Sonelli's comments. Um, it's 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 really all the things that we're looking at. I'm definitely going to ping him for a, a coffee uh, to continue our, our chat, um, awesome. and then Rob, you can definitely get a, a second round of, of this conversation. Um, okay. To answer that question, uh, we we notify the merchant with an SMS um, as as the as soon as the transaction is completed successfully. So the merchant um, or the the individual accepting the payment will receive an SMS, and we also have a back office tool where you can uh, view all your payments uh, uh, live. So this is what I've presented on the screen right now. So this is, for example, my personal SnapScan merchant account. And here you can see every single individual uh, account that's in here. Um, uh, oh, sorry, every individual transaction. And you can also see a number of the references that every user would have made um, when making those payments. So th there's there's a number of ways that you can receive it, and it's really up to the merchant um, how they want to configure the way in which they trade um, to you know to receive these notifications in a way that best suits their business. All right, well, cool. Um, thank, thank you very much, for Chris, for, for that um, some feedback. Um, so, Nelly, I'm going to pose the second question to you. Um, and the question is, is there a way to get customers who are not part of the formal banking economy to use um, platforms like SnapScan or other platforms? And I think the phrase different way that could also be your views on how we could stimulate uptake of, of, of uh, mobile um, banking, um, mobile payment platforms. Any feedback on that, Sanele? Thanks. It's quite a tough one. Um, it's okay. You don't have to solve the problem. Just, yeah, just your, uh, I just mean, your thoughts. I, 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 I uh, look. I mean, yeah. Look, I'm not an expert in the banking, <laughs> in the banking system, but I think, um, I think it's 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 more to Chris actually. It's. Okay. I, I think this question is is asking is. I think this question is asking if a merchant is not part of a banking economy. Um, how do they use SnapScan, right? Or am I reading this question? Is this this question no, by different right. governments? Yeah. 
That's right. That's um, right. Yeah, can, can I take a quick stab at yeah, that sure. one? Go for right. it. No problem. Tag team is all good. <laughs> so, um, so, so I'm, I'm hoping that nobody from, from our shareholders from Standard Bank will be watching this, this uh, webinar. But so I'm just going to give my very quick um, uh, personal view. I think banking uh, in South Africa um, has, has become very exclusionary um, because of the regulation that's attached to it. So, so, so banking, um, because of a number of, of legislation and, and regulatory approaches in South Africa, it, to some extent is exclusionary. So the, the comments that Sonele made earlier are 100% true, right? There's this big race to, um, to include members of what we see as an informal economy uh, into, into a more formalized environment uh, where we can remove tenders like uh, or tender types like cash and and make it digital, but in the same breath, you know, um, it's as Sonali said, it's it's difficult for a merchant in that environment to register a bank account um, and to jump through all these hoops that banks want them to jump through, in order to then start participating in this more formal economy, um, and that's a, a lot of the work that that we're doing, um, and that the Payments Association of South Africa is actually busy with, uh, in saying how do we how do we reduce the um, the requirements for these merchants um, to to become banked or to to have access to a store of value or a wallet um, of some sort? Um, and it's definitely a focus um, from all of us. You know, in order to use SnapScan today, you have to load a debit or a credit card into into the application in order to scan and pay. What we're looking at is saying. Well, fine. And uh, we know that that um, credit and debit cards are prevalent in the uh, formal economy. But really, what Snapscan wants to achieve in the next few years is to not just have an economic impact, but also a social impact. And that requires us to relook at the types of tender types that we allow uh, in these in these ecosystems that Sonele has um, alluded to. Um, and that's going to require. Um, you know, making wallets for individuals and letting them use our application, even if they don't have a debit or a credit card, and perhaps going through a very light version um, uh, of, of identifying that consumer um, and opening a very light bank account for them. I think a number of the players in the industry are looking towards uh, doing that. Um, and I, I'm quite enthused by that because... You know, SnapScan alone cannot achieve that on, on our own. We need a number of other players to also rally the regulators um, and the guys that write the, the paper but don't necessarily go into the township and see how these transactions happen um, to get them to make concessions around how we can process payments, what the risk parameters are that we have to operate within uh, in order to have that social uh, impact and become truly inclusionary um, to uplift those those merchants. That's really my dream, I think, for, for our product. Um, I, I would hate for us to just be this debit and credit card product uh, for the foreseeable future. Okay. Th th thank you, Chris. Um, that, that was really excellent. Um, I think if, if I may, Chris, um, and you can indulge me, if, if we could use that as your, your, your closing comments, um, just in the interest sure. of time. But, but Sanele, um, I'd just like to hand over to you maybe for a last word before I round off. Um, are there any last thoughts or closing comments you'd like to share um, just before we round off? And then um, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stream. Yeah, no, thanks, uh, Robert. Uh, all I'm going to say is uh, I'm quite open. I think my details are on, uh, are on your... Um, uh, um, invite. Um, this is this this is something that we feel very passionate about and very strongly about. And um, I just want to end off feeling that what Chris said just now really, really, really excites me because we need to think of ideas on how to incentivize the the, the informal market merchants to be part of the economy. At the moment, we disincentivize it. If if there's anything I want to learn is that. A lot of the, the things that we put in place are, 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 are a disincentive. There's, there's no incentive for them to get out of, of where they currently are. So if anyone wants to have a conversation about that and how do we incentivize, how do we add, how do we bring, add more value in the informal economy, I'm, I'm all open. Okay. 
Thank you very much. So, so on, on that note to both um, Sanele and to Chris um, from the digital economy team and from our audience, thank you very much uh, for your time um, and for all your efforts and inputs into preparing for today's presentation and then for the actual really valuable and insightful presentation. So to, to Snapscan and Sakika Solutions and to both of you, thank you very much. It's been great having you on board. Um, and just before I, I sign off to our audience members, thank you um, for your, your, your patience. I know we're slightly over time, but I'll just take us through one or two more slides um, before we end the session. Okay, so um, just as we uh, move on from our speakers for today, um, a bit of uh, info on what's coming up next. So in July, there happens to be one more week left, my goodness, in, in this month for a webinar. Uh, we'll be focusing on mobile digital literacy next week with the University of the Western Cape um, Co-Lab for Social Innovation and e Inclusion. And then we're currently busy finalizing our August program. So please keep an eye on your inboxes um, and social media for our upcoming August program. Then, as I'd mentioned before, we have recordings of all 12 and today's one will also be added. All 12 of previous webinars on our website. You can see it at the top of your screens. Um, so if you want to go back and check out some of the really great content we have there um, that we put there over the past few weeks, please do so. I'll just work through this quite quickly. And um, then I think the last thing I do want to say um, in closing is firstly, once again, just to, our, to both our presenters, which I think gave, gave really great sessions today. And as I, you could see, there's, there's much more um, to delve into on these topics and um, but but in the future we'll, we'll look at going into these these areas a bit deeper but to our audience members thank you very much again for your interest and for your your time today uh, it's been great having you with us for our regulars good to see you again uh, for our new members we hope to see you in our upcoming sessions um, and then also to our digital economy team who makes all this happen um, in the back in the background and behind the scenes thank you to you too so from us here yeah, at the Go Digital Western Cape webinar team, thanks once again. Stay warm, stay safe, and we will see you next time. Bye, everybody. <laughs>